So there's two main types of knives that I make, and I'll show these two. Um, this one was a forged knife, uh -huh. and this one is stock removal. So stock removal, there's two main things. Stock removal, you start with a bar of steel and cut out your shape, and it never really hits the forge until the hardening process. As with this one, started out as a piece of metal and was hot, forged, and taken and manipulated to that shape where this one was cut and ground to the shape. So that's the two main types, and that really... That's the main start you get either you start with a blank that's cut to the shape of the knife or you start with a bar that you have to forge into the shape of the knife. Tennessee Wildcast is live on the air with the latest on hunting, fishing, boating, and all things outdoors. Make welcome your host, drummer and outdoor expert novice, Jason Harmon. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Tennessee Wildcast. Uh, we thank you all for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Uh, and as you can see, we are on location again here at Union University. Uh, thanks to those folks for letting us use their uh, one of their classrooms for today's show got a special guest with us he's a jack of all trades his name is jack ladd and he's going to tell us about what all he's into and one thing that he enjoys is uh making knives so it's bladesmithing so that's going to be the main topic of today's show and i guess bladesmithing is a word i'm not sure but i, I used it anyway and then we have miss amy spencer snyder spencer she is our co-host today and thanks for setting this up yeah i met jack last year at the uh, bagoda dovefield um we were doing some photos for mint and jack was up there and i was like he had this knife on his belt and I'm you know I'm always looking at stuff and I was like nice knife and he's like yeah I made it just like in casual talking and I'm like what so we talked for a couple minutes and I was like let me get some information uh, I might want to do a sh do a show on you yeah. and as soon as we uh, left the uh, area manager Jason Maxidon started filling me in and he's like oh my gosh this kid's like into everything and he could do everything and you've really got to talk to him so so uh, I'm excited to have him. Yep. So Should I actually went out and did a little visit at his house and watched him make a knife. He started on a knife, and uh, Lord, did I find out all kinds of neat stuff about him. Yeah. Um, you really are jack of all trades. Uh, you got all these hobbies here that we're looking at. You've done triathletes. You've uh, and you won one at what seven? You won your first ten k at age eight, and then. You, let's see, you were coin collecting and selling coins, and then you get into rock collecting. Oh, wait, somewhere in there you build a wooden bow out of Osage Orange, and <laughs> then you're rock collecting, and then that got into flint napping, and I had to ask what was flint napping, and then that is? Uh, the making of Indian arrowheads. Making of his, own, yeah, his arrowheads, and then awesome. you, leather works, and then now you're into bladesmith. Yes, ma'am. So, so what... Yeah. Yeah, tell us a little bit about some of those others out there. I want to I wanna hear about some of this. Uh Oh my goodness! I've done everything. It seems like I cannot stick to one thing. Can't so, sit still. Uh, can't still. No, no. <laughs> when you're young, you know your dad's your hero. So dad's a big triathlete. So I had to keep going and carrying that through. And then for some reason, when you grow up, for some reason, dad's not your hero anymore, <laughs> and you want to have nothing to do with what he does. So I stopped that and then got into coin collecting, which is weird because at my school, I just I went to a little private school. So I started buying foreign coins in bulk and then just sell them to people to make a little bit of profit. Hey, um, entrepreneur right there. <laughs> from there, I went into rock collecting, which was because my grandfather is into that. And then that kind of transitioned into being more interested in the um, primitive, like, Indian stuff. Sure. So I started out with that flint napping, which really, that was the first thing I got really deep into, like, a hobby. And I started going to the North Georgia nap-in every year which is a nap-in is where a bunch of people get together and just kind of have a fun time doing it together. And then it seems like a lot of the people who are into this flint napping also like knife making. Mm. I met a man named James Gibson, who I did not know is actually an amazing knife maker and really prominent in the field. And he kind of led me to a guy in my town that I had no clue about that I'd started working with, and he got me farther into knife making. And now I'm here, I guess. Wow. And and even leather works. You make your own sheaths for your knives and yes, sir. stuff like that. Man, that's awesome. But I do have to ask this because uh, his jack of all trades, you actually won the science fair with the hoverboard that you made. Oh, yes. And I think seventh grade, we had a science fair and I decided that I was just going to go all out. Nobody else even really tried that hard. So I don't know why I decided to go so hard. And then I got a buddy. I was like, hey, we're going to make a hoverboard. So I'd have mm. been like, what? We spent like no volcano? <laughs> quite a few hours a doing the gun. hoverboard. A <laughs> and then we had to make a big video sequence of us using it. And that led to, I mean, of course we won. But 
Awesome. So uh, tell us a bit about that. Did it, and I guess it worked. And it oh, it worked. We did. We went to a local church and went across a whole basketball court, just floating around back and forth. Wow. That's and I did cool. ask him, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I got the, of course, the kid answer. I don't know. I don't know. No clue. You going to go to college? I don't know. Probably not. I don't know. <laughs> so a set of skills. He doesn't need college. Yeah, he's he's no. doing great. This is awesome. So um, let's start out with Bladesmith. Tell us about what that. Is yeah, what, what is it? What is bladesmithing? Yeah. Um, so bladesmithing is, bl- smithing is more of a form of forging your own knives. So bladesmithing is the part mainly where you're getting it hot and forming it. And then I guess you can carry that out into the grinding and then finishing handle work and stuff like that. Okay. All right. So there's a lot of process. There's a lot of steps. Um, let's jump into the steps real quick and how to do that. And then we will come back to, to your mentor. You kind of mentioned some of that, but how do you start making a knife? Okay. So there's two main types of knives that I'll make, and I'll show these two. Um, this one was a forged knife, uh-huh. and this one is stock removal. So... Stock removal, there's two main things. Stock removal, you start with a bar of steel and cut out your shape, and it never really hits the forge until the hardening process. As with this one, started out as a piece of metal and was hot, forged, and taken and manipulated to that shape where this one was cut and ground to the shape. So that's the two main types, and that really, that's the main start. You get either, you start with a blank that's cut to the shape of the knife, or you start with a bar that you have to forge into the shape of the knife. Okay. Um, and then from there, after forging and cutting and all that, you would go into grinding, which this is the one of the main parts of the knife is the bevel. So that's the part where it goes from the, the thickness at the spine, and it has to taper down to a sharp cutting edge. Mm-hmm. So your bevel is where you're going to spend most of your time grinding because it has to be really precise and even and go to a really narrow, thin point. Are, After, do you eyeball all that, or is there some kind of tool um, that helps you? A lot of times you can take a caliper and run along the edge okay. that gets you to the about the right p- part, mm-hmm. but really most of it is eyeballing and kind of just learning to feel with your hands, Yeah, like sloping down, feeling how it I'm goes. not allowed to play with sharp objects. So. <laughs> yeah, we, won't, we don't want to cut, <laughs> cut anybody's yeah. hand here on but the show. But he did have a pretty cool tool yesterday that you were showing me. That, is that the caliper you were talking about? or um, that is a, it's, a fi- it's called a filing jig. And it clamps on, and it, it's tungsten, so your none of your tools will cut it. So it's tungsten right here, and I didn't have it at either of the time that I made these. Well, I think I did have it for this part on this one. But you can clamp it on and then use your files or your grinder to make a straight line on that matches on both sides. So it would clamp onto this, like here, clamp like that, and it's perfectly flat on this side. So I could file, and that keeps me from keeping having no gaps right through this area right here. Hmm. Um, and then after this process of getting it all shaped up and grinded out, you'd go into hardening, which is the make or break moment of a knife. So a lot of times you'll get I've to the, that of fire. Yeah. a lot of times you'll get to the, um, the point where you have a beautiful knife and then hardening just completely ruins it cracks in half or all kinds of bad stuff can go, can happen. So, so is hardening, uh, is that heat as well? Is that how they harden you? Are you baking Um, it, or what's the process of that? So with hardening, it has a few steps. The main part is that you'll have to do a thermocycling, which is taking you up to what is called critical temp, which is around the 1400s. And at critical temperature, the metal will no longer stick to a magnet. So that's the main way to tell that you've gotten to this critical temperature. And it said all the stuff in the metal is so hot and moving around so fast that it doesn't have time to stick to one spot and stay to that magnet. Okay. So that's the main wow. thing. And you heat it up to that, let it cool down to room temperature, and do that a few times. And then on, I normally do three times. So on my third time, I heat it up to critical temperature. And then you go for your make or break moment, which is called that quench, where you quench it into a substance. There's all different things. Sometimes water. But water is makes it really hard, but water also cracks about 50% of the knives you quench in it. Huh. So I normally do um, oil, which is a viscous substance. Something right. more viscous yeah. doesn't cool it down as quick. So there it's really fastly um, cooling it down, mm-hmm. which is going to harden your edge, really stiff everything up. But at that point, the knife is so hard r- right out of the quench that say you dropped it on the concrete, it would just shatter like glass. Wow. So after that, you go into tempering. <laughs> so tempering is taking it into an oven. Normally, I'll sand it back down, and you'll put it in a, an oven at about 425-ish. It depends on the steel, really. So that, uh, uh, biscuits are good at 425, too. Hey, Mom, does he do this in your oven in the house? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. All right. She does not like it. It's, right. It makes the whole house smell like French fries because that hey. oil's still on well, it. I mean, <laughs> it's not bad. Um, Could be worse. Yeah. 
So after that, we take it to what's like a golden brown color, and that softens it, but it doesn't soften it to the point where it's not hard anymore, but it makes it where it won't just break on impact. It'll flex and bend. Mm. Um, after that, we go into hand sanding, which is the part that makes every knife maker just want to kill themselves, really, because <laughs> you sit there for up to like hours on a knife, sit there with sandpaper just rubbing out every scratch you've had. Mm. So this one and these two, you can see the finish. When you finish with the grinder, all your scratches are running this way because you hold it like that uh -huh. and the belt's coming this way. But then you go on and you want all your scratches to be that way. So you'll start out with, I normally start out like at a really low grit, like 36 on the grinder. And then I'll come off the grinder and go to like a 50 grit sandpaper. And then you go this way with 50. And then you go this way with like 120. Mm -hmm. So you make want to make sure you have no longer straight scratches. And then you'll just go back and forth alternating. And this one is up to, I think, 800. So it, you've so really got to work your yeah. way up, and it takes quite a few hours on, of that, mm. the most tedious part. And then from there, we go on to, you got to tape all this up so you don't get scratches in your blade, and you'll go on to handle, which is probably one of my favorite parts because it's a lot more forgiving than everything else. Mm -hmm. And with that, I can choose any material, but you'll start out with a block of material, and the first thing you do is you drill your holes on the side of the knife to keep it stable, and then you got to contour your front, which is a mistake that a lot of people forget to do. They'll not do it. And then you'll have a block attached to your handle, and it's like two different lengths on the side. And then you can't, if you try to go down and grind it, then you're going to scratch your blade all up. So you do that, and then you're ready for your um, gluing up. So I use a two-part epoxy. A lot of times I use five-minute because I'm really impatient. Yeah. <laughs> but, then you, but then I'll end up like screaming my head off because like I'll be like four minutes into that, and I'm sitting there, and it's not on yet. So you're just like having to rush it all because if you don't do that, then you've ruined everything and have to refinish all the knife stuff. So really a lot of people use 30, but I use five because I'm impatient. Yeah. Um, and then from there you'll grind, after it's dried, you'll grind it to the edge of the knife, which with this you would do, um, you go to the edge of the knife because this is called a full tang, which means that the metal runs all the way around this knife. With this would be considered hidden tang. So once it goes inside the handle here, it really narrows out. And so that just has a hole in the handle that this fits into. And there's still a pin in it, mm -hmm. but it's only one, and it's so it's wood on all sides. It's beautiful. Yeah, I was going to ask about those pins. Uh, do, you, uh, or do you measure those out and then hammer them in? How does that work? Um, so with the pins, you don't have to be super accurate because when you're at that block stage, you'll put it in, and they'll be sticking out of the side. But then once you do it, you just grind them to the face. Okay. But with one of these, it's a little bit more complicated because with this, you want to pin the pin over. So it's wider on the end, so it's more of a rivet holding it together. Gotcha, gotcha. Even though there's still epoxy, you just want that because your guard can shift a lot easier on one of these. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned this one earlier. This was one of the hardest ones to make because of that guard. or that's There's more time into oh, yeah. that. Talk about crafting one of those. Okay, so this was the first knife I ever made with a guard, and it was the first knife that really, like, made me cry. <laughs> like, I spent, I don't know how many times. This was probably the third guard I made for this because one of the hard parts is right here. You don't want any gaps in between the blade and this guard because it's two separate pieces of metal. So you really have to take your time on filing it just to super tight, like thousandth of an inch can matter in this. So it's just hours of just filing, and you'll just you'll sit there and file for 20 minutes and maybe take off a thousandth of an inch mm. just because you're trying to be so detailed and accurate. And when you like when you do the slot in your guard, it has to be super narrow, but you can't just drill a hole down because it will normally end up wider. So you drill one hole and then file all the rest of that out, which just takes hours. Yeah. And then once you get to that point on the first guard, I remember I got to this point, and it looked so good, and then I hammered it on once, and it just stretched it out, and then it, there were gaps on either side of it. So start it over again, and then on the second time, somehow the size drill bit I had in my drill press had gotten switched out, so then I drilled all that, filed all that out, and it turns out it was way wider than this. Uh -huh. And then on this one, I finally just took super thin drill bits and then just took my time on filing. I'd file for a minute, slide it on, see, file for a minute, and just keep going mm -hmm. until it would fit all the way up to here, but it had no gaps. I tell you what, that's real tedious patience, yeah, and, everything. Yeah, and, and I mean, when he talks about he doesn't have any patience, um, well, we were to. there. <laughs> Yeah, he's got to have patience, but while I was there, you know, we're waiting around. He's doing pull-ups over there. and I'm like, <laughs> Training for that triathlon. No, nah, he's training for his <laughs> rock climbing now. Uh, well, 
<clears throat> to the blade. I mean, to the uh, handles. I see. This is you told me earlier. What kind of wood is that handle? There? Um, this is amboina. It's the burl of an amboina tree. So, amboina is a South American softwood, which means I have to stabilize it, which is a process of I didn't do it myself. Um, but it's a process where they take it and put it into a vacuum chamber with resin, so that um, soaks up all the resin. Because when it's a softwood like that, it would get really marred up and right. wouldn't be suitable for a handle, and it could crack a lot easier. So they put that resin into the wood, and it stabilizes it to where it can be wet, and it makes it basically an artificial type material because it can get wet, and then it's no longer has all those problems you get with a natural material. But Amboina is a South American softwood that's really expensive, and I really hope this was legally sourced because you have no clue. <laughs> this could have just been it's pretty. It's cut amazing. out of a nature reserve somewhere in South America. But from that point, we go, and we'll take it. This started off as a block, and I would – um, do the rough shaping, put that in, and then just go and take all my time sanding to get the right tolerances and match it up with this. Do card. you have to to figure out like where it fits nicely in your hand and and determine the the dips and the? A lot of times, I'll start out a handle really large for the size, and then just slowly feel. I mean, my hand is different than everybody else's. Right, right. I have big hands, but go and just feel till I think. Like you'll go and you'll feel one spot that's like kind of digging in, so you'll just take that out. And go it from there. He had one he was working on yesterday, and, and I grabbed it, and I was like, "Man, I love it! It fits so good." So anyway, I was, you know, I'm trying to work on that one. So if we can. Yeah, one of those. She was looking at a blacksmith knife, which is a lot different from these, in the fact that the whole thing is a metal construction. So I would go and I'd forge out the blade, and then you forge a long tail, which is really thin and goes, and then you fold it over to the shape and make a little guard out of it, and you fold yeah, it to the shape cool. of the handle. Which is, a, I love them. That's cool. Uh, it, it fits so good yesterday, so. Um, can people see some of the stuff you've been doing? Tell them, you have an Instagram page? Um, I have an Instagram, because I guess I'm young, so hey, I don't I'll, use Facebook. Everybody's got Instagram. Um, I, have a, I have a Facebook that I never use, but on Instagram is the main thing I stick to, and that shows all my work, which right now I don't have a website or anything for selling my work, mm -hmm. strictly because I have so many people wanting them that I have no need to sell to people that I don't know. <laughs> But so at some point I'll get, I'll start selling yeah. um, make a website that would be attached to that. But it's uh, J Lad Ironworks is uh, his uh, Facebook. Awesome. Yeah, I was looking at that last night and checking out some of the stuff. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Some of the work on there, and, and we're showing some pictures. We got some pictures for people to see if you're all now, watching. But you you have your favorite materials that you like to use, and mm -hmm. you were talking about a certain wood yesterday that I'd never heard of. I think it's. I can't even remember the name of it. It's like Alabama, Georgia, somewhere. In there. What was what was this okay? Wood? So there's this wood called Chittum, which it only grows in North Alabama, North Alabama, and then like somewhere in Arabia or something. Huh. It's like a really rare, rare wood, and it was actually what the Ark, Ark of the Covenant was made out of, which I found is an interesting fact. Cool. And I have a friend who's about my age. It's also a knife maker in North Alabama named Will Freeman, close to the Huntsville area, and he goes out and harvests this stuff and can just sell it for as much as he wants to, because nobody else has it. And it's illegal to cut down unless it is a dead standing tree, which mm. is kind of an interesting fact. Yeah. Which I don't know. He don't showed know us some him. of it yesterday, and I think it was in some of the pictures that I sent to you, but it, it's it's really pretty. I mean, and I'd never heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, it, it was. it's become really rare due to the fact that in the Civil War, it was one of the only things in the U.S. that you could use to make yellow dye, which it, around that time, that was the only thing they had. So they cut down most of it, and now it only it only grows out of, rock like really rocky areas mm. but every single piece i don't know if you're familiar with the burl of wood but burl is like a big off grow that's really no grain structure or anything so it's a lot prettier but it's technically like a messed up piece of wood mm -hmm. but um it's a lot prettier so a lot of people go from that and the interesting thing about chittum is that every single tree has burl on it it grows out and it's one big burl with this a little tree growing out of the top of it Hmm. Is it kind of like a knot? And they say yeah, it looks yeah, like a yeah, big exactly knot. Looks okay. like. I saw somewhere one of the shows I've watched, like in Texas, they were going out and harvesting for certain wood, but for so, that was a different type of one. But I've right. seen them where they're specifically looking for that, and they'll pay high dollar for those types of woods because they can do specialty things with them. So yeah. And then I noticed one uh, type of handle you were using, like a paracord or something like that. Yeah, I've done quite a bit of that. For a lot of times, if you want somebody to not have to pay as much for a knife, you can do a leather wrap or just a paracord wrap, which is a lot simpler, but it still makes a comfortable handle that will get the job done. Mm -hmm. But what's your favorite to use? Like your, 
If you if you were going to do one for you again, what would you do? If I could use one material for the rest of my life, handle wise, it'd be this, which is canvas micarta. So they take a canvas cloth material and press it down and put. Um, this one was done with fiberglass resin, but it's all kinds of different resins and epoxies that they put and then soaks up into that material and makes it into more of a hard thing. But the thing is that it's waterproof and just really it can take a really high temperature. So it's just a really durable material, but you still get that natural look with it. It, it looks, looks like, like a yeah. it looks like something natural. Looks like wood, yeah. Which and I you just said it's canvas. It. Canvas. Hmm. That's awesome. That's cool. So and now you've got a couple of fixed blade knives. You ever done any folding knives or? Um, I've made like one little folding knife that uh -huh. I just it's the tolerances for the machinery I have. A lot of times with folding knives, you'd want something like um, a milling machine just to get the grooves right because. Even though this takes a lot of attention to detail, a folding knife just takes tons more that I just, I don't think I could do it without hurting myself. Yeah. So tell us, uh, what would you use these knives for? Do you make skinning knives and other, other knives for, for outdoor activities, or what's your, what's your main focus? So a lot of my main knives are this style, but a little bit smaller, and I just call them a utilitarian knife. Mm -hmm. I say skin a cat, do whatever you want to do <laughs> with it. <laughs> Skin a cat, cut your steak. Don't do skin whatever a cat. you need to. No. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> uh, you gotta have a sense of humor. And that knife, was one yeah. thing with him yesterday. He does have a good sense of humor, uh, and you know that's always good. So yeah, that was humor, people. Yeah, <laughs> I, I thought I saw one but with a gut hook on it. It actually, you, I've made a few with gut hooks. Yeah, yeah he yeah. says um, one of the things I was reading up on is that you sell a lot of them to outdoorsmen, not hunters, and yeah. And our area is really known. West Tennessee is really just known for hunting, so a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Use it for that point. But that gut hook you were talking about, I call it the mouse hook. Because really the blade was like much smaller than this. And the gut hook was like an eighth inch. So you really couldn't even use it on anything <laughs> other than like maybe, a mouse. maybe cutting the yeah. trachea of a mouse. <laughs> hey, we could get it here for a union and they could have yeah, it Yeah, they could use it in their, in their classes, yeah. So one thing, um, you've talked about some challenges and some things. But what, what are some of the challenges that you've found making the knives? So the main thing is um, keeping consistency and just... Like here, if you look at this knife, it's not perfect right here in this area, which is the choil area. And then it's not my, perfect. Yeah. My okay. plunge cuts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you might need some breeding glasses for this. <laughs> yeah, well, But you look up <laughs> real close, and you see that those two lines aren't perfectly even, which a lot of people Perfectionist. like. A lot of people in the knife-making community, the first thing you do is you pick up somebody's knife, and you're like, let's see how good it is. Like, this one's near perfect, because I'd really spent my time on mm -hmm. that one. But a lot of times you'll pick that up, and that's, like, one of the hardest things to keep even. And then another thing is when you're grinding, when you go from side to side, your body naturally does two different motions. Right. So a lot of times you'll try to do the same thing, and, like, one side at the top of this will end up curved, and one side will end up, like, a super straight line. And it's just really hard to keep the consistency in your bevels, too, on having the same top line. Wow, and my things, voice I mean, is cracking a lot. I, I just got sick the other day. Yeah, it's not yeah, gone away. yeah. Okay, we got another note here before we run out of time. What kind of equipment? So and and he had a lot of it yesterday. But the one thing I will say is he had a very old anvil, and that is one of his goals is to getting a. <laughs> yeah. So my anvil, my mentor gave it to me when I first started, and then the other day I was working with him. He was like, "You still use that crappy old thing?" And I was like, "Yes, I still use that crappy old thing." Well, look what it's making though. I um, know. Yeah. So my so with your anvil, a lot of times you want a really clean face. And mine looks more like Swiss cheese on the top. It's just like <laughs> holes everywhere. So it's hard to keep a perfectly straight blade and stuff like that. But a good anvil can run you $1,200, hmm. like just right out there, $1,200 for a standard, like 150-pound anvil. So that's something that takes a lot of saving up for. And then my pride and joy is my knife-making grinder, which is a 2 by 72 belt grinder, which I saved up forever. I used this one. I went from like a 1-inch one, one wide, 36 inches, and then I went to like a two inch wide, 36 inches, and now I'm at a two by 72. So, and it's variable speed and all that nice stuff. But that was, I think, the most expensive thing I've bought. It was around $3,000 hmm. for that one piece of equipment. But that's like the And it staple. has its own room. Yeah, it has its own room. Yeah. But that, like, only that works in that room. But it's like <laughs> kind of the staple, like the main tool you need. Yeah, you need definitely. An anvil, hammer, forge. And then after that, all you need is a grinder. So, uh, tell us about the forge. Uh, you said you uh, got that from a local guy up in East Tennessee. Is that okay, right? so my forge came from a guy in East Tennessee. I never met him. I was somewhere when they went up to meet him. Uh, cool. I need to go work with him sometime. He's invited me too. But it's a very small forge that I just, I just love it because it like a lot of times people big. have a big bulky forge with this thing. 
and then that just eats through some propane. So mine has a hole sure. that's just wide enough to fit your knife in, so it doesn't run through nearly as much. And we have some pictures of it, too, I yeah. know. It doesn't run through nearly as much propane because you just fit your knife in. And it's very small, and all it is, it's called a single brick forge because they take fire bricks, which is what's used to make it, mm -hmm. and it's a, about the size of a cinder block, like cut mm -hmm. down the middle, gotcha. about that size. Yeah. Um, and it just has that one little hole, but it's super fire retardant. And then you just have a blower that goes in the side that, as your propane goes down this tube, it has knots in it that makes it take in oxygen at the same time. So it mixes it before it gets to the forge, hmm. and that's where it heats up. Gets it really, really hot. What t what temperatures are you running in there? Um, I don't know. We cranked it up yesterday to so try yesterday, to get some certain So yesterday photos. to try to get this one good picture of me hitting something <laughs> and, and sparks flying everywhere. <laughs> we got it, it after, <laughs> I think, the second try. Yeah. Um, I was probably running it at about 2,000 ish degrees and mom was saying turn it down yeah <laughs> don't burn up the building so think about safety you got to wear all the gear and and, and he is like that. i found this out you're osha yeah, i have an osha 10 course yeah so which impressive i, I mean i was I like surprised because you know and yesterday he was wearing all of it he had his a uh, mask on well, and he yes and he had his glasses on and he was very cautious on what he was doing and at some point in time i'm sure you've well he was when i was there now yeah. i don't know what he maybe does maybe just for her <laughs> so if you accidentally touch the hot part and just, oh my goodness scars know. everywhere from just this thing the problem is that it's so hot that you don't have time yeah. to react to what it does so exactly, right yeah. here i have a scar right here that was just from i was holding something up drop it and just as it glances by it does mm. that so it's a really dangerous hobby really yeah yeah. So tell us about being on TV. Uh, you said you had a Facebook page. You're not on there much, but uh, tell us about some of that he stuff. He was on a Facebook page, I think, for school or something. Is, I was reading I'm not the, sure. where you'd been in. Something. Yeah, I saw a picture. You were getting interviewed by a TV station there locally. Okay, I guess. so the last local. He looks so young. The last <laughs> local TV station, I think it was, it was probably two years ago. And it was just a nightmare re watching that thing. Because <laughs> I was just like, the, he was like, so what's your favorite part? And I just go, I like it when the metal gets high. <laughs> and then that's like all I said for the whole interview was like, it's but really. But he looked like he was so, I mean, he looked like really he was hot. five, you know, and I'm looking at the pictures. Yeah, I've gotten a little video. bit more mature since then. All right. Well, we're going to run out of time. we got about two minutes left. And uh, so um, just appreciate you being with us today. And, and, uh, and uh, I want to say, know, impressive fun. kid. I mean, it's nice to hear kids that are out there doing something besides playing with video games and watching TV and playing on their phones all the time. You're actually doing stuff. And it was it was a nice welcome. And I actually took my son up there yesterday, and I was hoping maybe he would might like say, hey, look, you know, this yeah. is what, let's do stuff like this. So, this. yes. All right. Well, thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you. Jack, it's been fun. And uh, maybe I'll get to come see your shop sometime. Maybe. That'd be fun. Come down anytime. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, keep watching. Keep tuning in. This is uh, Tennessee Wildcast. We appreciate you doing that. Uh, check out our social media. We're out there everywhere. And we appreciate y'all tuning in. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Stay connected with TWRA by visiting our website at tnwildlife.org. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hey, it's all about Tennessee wildlife. It's what we do. Tennessee Wildcast will be on the air again next week. We'll see you then.